Okay, welcome back. So we finished up with the book of Ruth last time, which was three weeks ago. So now we're ready to start the book of 1 Samuel. So let's open with, with prayer. Heavenly Father, we praise your name for remaining with your people, for being faithful to your promises. We thank you for continuing the messianic line through David and for continuing the promise to build a house for him. Um, we thank you for sending the king, the fulfillment of those prophecies in Jesus Christ, your son. Open to us now the scriptures by your spirit that we may see your son in the prophecies of the Old Testament and see the, your goodness and faithfulness towards your people. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Okay, so when we left off, Israel had already kind of hit rock bottom um, with the episode with the Levite and his concubine. And they're kind of sort of on their way back up, but they've got a ways to go. This is still the time of the judges. Historically, there are like 15 judges. So there are two of them we haven't met yet. They'll be in 1 Samuel. Now, in the Old Testament, books were written in rolls, right? You have a roll of vellum or parchment or whatever it is, and then it's, it's rolled around a central, like a rod. And that's, that's how books of the Old Testament are, are written. In the New Testament, the church doesn't necessarily invent the codex, but uses it exclusively for binding the New Testament. So the New Testament is never ever written in a scroll. It's written in a codex, that is, leaves of paper that are stacked and bound on one side. We, we know this format very well, uh, because it's how our books are, are bound. Um, but in the Old Testament, books are written on rolls or scrolls, and so you would have a scroll containing Isaiah, a scroll containing Deuteronomy, you know, whatever. In Samuel's case, Samuel is too long for one roll. It's like back in the days of VHS where you had to get like, you know, both the cassettes. It was a two-parter. So in some Bibles... Samuel is one book. In all English Bibles, as far as I know, unless someone's trying to be a real smart aleck, it's two, right? So 1st and 2nd Samuel are really just part one and part two of the same book. So if, if you were to encounter a book in another language and it had just Samuel, they're not playing with you. But in English, it's always been divided up into two, 1st and 2nd Samuel. With the book of Judges, the story encompassed a very long period of time, and so you would have, you know, vignettes, episodes that were shorter in their span and more detailed, but then you'd have three or four verses where 300 years pass. That's not happening in First and Second Samuel, right? This is going to encompass a much shorter period of time, and it's especially going to focus on three men, and they are Samuel, I mean, you know, obviously, right? <laughs> Not all the questions are hard. Saul and David. So, literarily speaking, you will find that First and Second Samuel are extremely well written for literature that doesn't mean that the stories are made up or fiction this is real history these things did happen these people lived but the skill with which these books are written is particularly high the literary quality is very good uh, we're going to see that today when we look at the song of hannah for example um but in terms of the, the, the movement of the book, the first, few, the first few chapters are going to deal with Samuel. U-E-L. 
Samuel. And they'll be kind of setting up the rest of the book. Then beginning with Saul, Samuel's going to anoint Saul. You'll have Saul's rise. And then, of course, Saul takes a downward trajectory. So his life consists of both rise and fall. David is going to rise and fall, but as you know, or you probably know, it happens somewhat within Saul's lifetime. So David is going to have this nice rising arc. He's going to ascend to the heights and then... Right? A rather precipitous decline. This being, of course, the episode with Bathsheba. The last few chapters are something like an epilogue. When the stories, especially of David's life, are recounted in a very poetic sort of way and ruminated upon. So today we're going to look at the first two chapters of 1 Samuel. We're going to meet the the, the, the characters, the people that are in the book. But um, in terms of timeline, a good milestone for the, for the timeline of the Old Testament is the year 1000. It's a nice round number, of course. During the year 1000, on the throne is David, right? David is going to reign a little before and a while after the year 1000. So his reign is going to span like, what, 1009 to 970? So we're backing up a little before then through the reign of Saul and into the life. And really the birth of Samuel is going to begin for Samuel. So we're up around, let's say, 1100, give or take. Right? So the, the authors of the Old Testament stop writing about 400 B.C. So we still have all of the rest of the writings of the prophets to go. Samuel is going to be kind of the first of these prophets. The last of the Old Testament prophets is a man named John the Baptist. We meet him every Christmas, right? Um, but there's going to be that, that interim period, that intertestamental period of about 400 years where there are no prophets writing and God is not really directly speaking to Israel. In terms of places that you need to know, remember the hill country of Ephraim? That's where a lot of the end of Judges happened, where a lot of the wicked men were happening. That's where the incident with the, the Levite and his concubine took place, the hill country of Eph Eph Ephraim. That's going to be west of the Jordan. So this side of the Jordan, where Jerusalem is, not on the other side. Um, and most of it's going to take place in the tribal lands of Judah. Right, Shiloh is going to be important because what's at Shiloh? Yeah, that's the tabernacle. What's the tabernacle? Yeah, the, the priests are there. The Ark of the Covenant is there, right? On top of the Ark of the Covenant is the mercy seat. And so the mercy seat is where the Lord is present um, to dispense grace for His people. That sits inside the most holy place, the Holy of Holies. Right? The tabernacle is a mobile structure. It's like a tent. After all, that's where the Ark of the Covenant was kept. That's where the Lord was present during the wandering in the wilderness, those 40 years. And so the, the, when, when the presence of the Lord went up and moved, they took up the tabernacle and they moved with him, right? It's been at Shiloh now for a bit. So that's kind of where the, the, the central uh, spiritual point for the tribes of Israel or, is going to be is at Shiloh. Lastly, an, another group of people you'll need to know the Philistines, the 
The Philistines are a group of Canaanites, meaning they're descended from Noah's son Ham. They are noted for their wickedness. I'm not going to say that there's never been a people that equal on the earth, but they're up there. Um, Particularly when it comes to idolatry, child sacrifice, uh, adultery, brutality, mockery of the Lord. Um, The Philistines were among the peoples that were supposed to have been wiped out during the time of the judges. Israel did not. And so the Lord left them in place to be a thorn in their flesh. And the Philistines are going to be a very nasty thorn, right? The Philistines are going to occupy the coastlands. Okay. One of the other things that, that we should know about First and Second Samuel is a recurring theme is that of the vow or the oath, right? You'll have people making vows, oaths to the Lord, and the Lord, um, the Lord making some as well, but vows are taken very seriously in, in Samuel. Uh, and, and when they're not taken seriously, they're punished. Certainly always a good lesson for us. Um, why, is, why is the Lord so interested in vows? Why, why does it matter to the Lord that we be faithful to our vows? He makes vows to us. Right? And we are to be like He is. He is faithful to His vows. And that's extremely important for those of us who don't see. That is, we live in a time where we do not see God in the way that, for example, Adam walked with God or Noah or even uh, the prophets might have had you know, God speaking to them. We only see because the Word reports to us, right? And there's much that is yet to be delivered to us. Like, at the, at the last day, our bodies will be raised to eternal life. We don't see that yet. The cemeteries are still full, right? The graves are still full. When, when we lay a body in the grave, it stays there. So the resurrection of the body remains an article of faith. That is, hope in something we haven't seen yet. Right? The, likewise, the destruction of the earth by fire, we haven't seen that yet. The heavenly Jerusalem, we haven't seen that yet. The new heavens, the new earth, we haven't seen that yet. So there's, there are many promises yet to be fulfilled that we are waiting on their deliverance. God's nature is that he is faithful to his promises. It's an essential attribute of who God is because we are in this, this middle point now between the first and second coming of, of our Lord Christ where we know he's been good to his promises so far and we trust that he'll continue to be good to his promises. He'll, he'll honor them on the last day. If we are to be a reflection of who God is, we are to keep vows that we make as well. It's also a good warning not to take vows in haste, right? When we teach the second commandment, we say, don't don't use God's name to vow, right? Just let your yes be yes, your no be no. Of course, there are instances, and the church has always recognized this, where we have to take a vow in order to serve our neighbor. For example, if you testify in court, you might have to swear, that is, use God's name, that your testimony is going to be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help you God, right? Well, this this is permitted because it serves the neighbor, right? You're either going to exonerate or or, um, you're going to you know, point to, you know, this person did this, whatever it is, there is, of course, the giant warning that if you're going to bring God's name into this, then the testimony you give had genuinely better be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. You brought God's name into this, you brought his name in as a witness that your testimony is true, it better be. Likewise, um, if you are, you know, if, if you are enlisted in the military, you'll have to take a vow to defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. The church permits this because it serves the neighbor. But since you brought God's name into this, you had better defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Right? So vows, very, very important thing. 
in Samuel. And we're going to see this already with, with Hannah and the birth of Samuel. Any other questions? Any, any other like preliminary stuff to go through? Awesome. Let's look at the text. 1 Samuel chapter 1. There was a certain man of Ramathim Zophim of the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, son of Zuth, the, an Ephrathite. He had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the other, Penina. And Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. Okay, so you have Elkanah. Elkanah's a man. He's an Ephraimite. He's living in the hill country of Ephraim. Ephraim, of course, one of the tribes of Israel, so he's, he is an Israelite. Um, he has two wives. One of them has children. One of them does not. Right. Um, again, one of the things that we discovered at the end of Judges is that Israel was sorely lacking in leadership. There wasn't any real authority in Israel to unify the people or to judge cases. Right. You had people just kind of doing their own thing. You know, these people were doing this and those people are doing that. There's not any organization among the tribes. You'll have some tribes, they've just kind of disconnected and shut down, and they're off doing their own thing. Where even is Dan at this point? I mean, you know, it's, it's very chaotic. It's obvious that they need to have some kind of, you know, unity together. They, they need spiritual leadership. They need political leadership. Um, here you have Elkanah. Um, we'll learn a little bit about his character in the, in the next part of the chapter. But what we know of him so far is he's an Ephrathite. He's, he's from uh, the, the tribe of Ephraim. And he's got two wives, right? Verse 3. Now this man used to go up year by year from his city to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh, where the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were priests of the Lord. So he's the kind of man who goes to the, to the tabernacle every year to offer sacrifice, right? So he's a believer. Um, he goes up, and we, we now meet Eli. Um, if, you, if you take the, the list of 15 judges, Eli is the 14th. Um, Eli has two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. This is not Phinehas, the son of Eliezer. That's a different Phinehas. Um, they're priests of the Lord, right? They're sacrificing there at the tabernacle. Remember, remember, that's what the tabernacle's for. You have the altar. There's sacrifices going on all the time. Verse 4. On the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Penina, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah he gave a double portion because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. So, Elkanah knows that he, he has two wives, and, he, and he, he makes provision for his wife, Penina, to have a sacrifice, and for all of her sons and daughters to have sacrifices. Hannah, he gives a double portion. Why? He loves her, right? So, Elkanah, he's, he's got two wives. It's not exactly how the Lord constitutes marriage. When, when, when the Lord creates Adam, he gives him Eve though it might have been expeditious to give him many wives to populate quickly, he gives her Eve, or he gives him Eve. Likewise, Shem, Ham, and Japheth each have a wife by which to populate the nations rather than giving them multiple wives. So, um, nonetheless, Elkanah is, is a godly man. He loves his wives. He, he makes provision for their sacrifices. And to Hannah, he gives a double, double portion because he knows her grief that the Lord closed her womb. That, that phrasing there is, is very important for us to remember where babies come from. I mean, yeah, okay, biology, sure. But children are ultimately a gift of, of the Lord. And the Lord gives, and sometimes He doesn't. The giving of children is, is the Lord's 
is the Lord's doing. And to Hannah, he's closed her womb. Now, we're going to find out later why. Um, he, he intends to do something great through her. But to many people, that's not the case. Um, so, Hannah understands that this is her, the, 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 this is the suffering that she bears, the cross that she bears in this life. And she, she goes to sacrifice. She doesn't, you know, she hasn't given up on God or anything. She's a pious woman. And Elkanah is not indifferent. He loves Hannah, understands her suffering, gives her the double portion to sacrifice to the Lord. However, one can imagine, I mean, I could only imagine the tension of having two wives. Because now instead of there being the relationship of a man and his wife, now there's two relationships, a man to each wife, and their relationship with one another. And, well, we're, we're going to see what that's like. Verse 6, And her rival, that is to say Penina, her rival used to provoke her grievously to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went on year by year. As often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. Therefore Hannah wept and would not eat. And Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? And why do you not eat? And why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? So Elkanah he seems like he's a good man. He consoles her. You know, you have me. Am I not worth more to you than ten sons? A little beside the point, Elkanah. It's <laughs> because Hannah's grief is, is of two natures. Her first grief is that the Lord has closed her womb, and she's, she's prayed for this, uh, but nonetheless she goes year after year to the, to the tabernacle, and um, the Lord has not yet granted her prayer. So there's that grief. There's also the grief of, there's this other wife, and not only does she have children, Penina mocks Hannah because Hannah doesn't have children. The Lord closed her womb. I mean, that's, that's really vicious. And the, you know, it, it grieves Hannah terribly. So when she goes to the, to the tabernacle, she doesn't eat. She weeps bitterly. And Elkanah comforts her. You know, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? Am I not more to you than ten sons? Maybe, but that's not the point, Elkanah. Um, anything so far? Questions? Okay, verse 9. Go ahead. It's a total man answer. Total man. I mean, uh, how, how does the saying go, bless his heart? Um, he's, he's trying. But of course, her, her grief is much deeper than, yeah, okay, I have you, Elkanah, but that's not, that's not, that's kind of not the point. Yeah. Right. Verse 9. After they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh, Hannah rose. Now Eli, the priest, was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor shall touch his head. So she's, she's, at, she's at the temple and, and understand when it says temple, we're not talking about the structure that Solomon builds, that David wants to build. We're talking about the tabernacle, right? So she's at the temple, tabernacle, and Eli's sitting there. He's at the doorpost. Um, she's there at the tabernacle. She's weeping bitterly, and she's, she's praying, and she makes a vow. Yeah, that's the Nazarite vow, right? Give me a son, and I will give him to you. That's not unique to Hannah. This is the command of the Lord ever since the Exodus, right? 
that because the Lord delivered the firstborn from the angel of death by the blood of the Lamb, the firstborn of all the Israelites was to be given to the Lord. We, we even found that in the seminary, by the way, that a lot of us were either only sons or firstborn. It's a far cry back from the day when people had inheritances, and so like the first son got the family business, the second son might have gotten something. After that, it's join the army or go to the, go to the ministry, right? Um, but Mercury 7, by the way, all firstborn sons are only children. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm firstborn, so you know I, I notice those sorts of things. <laughs> That's right. But the firstborn was to be dedicated to the Lord. I don't know that it was terribly specific beyond that, but Hannah is. Hannah is going to say what? Give to your servant, that is to, to me, Hannah, a son. I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall touch his head. And that, yeah, that's, that's the Nazarite vow. We, that's back from the book of Numbers. That's the vow that the Lord uh, commanded Samson to take, right? Um, and so this is, this is Hannah's prayer. And it's, it's a vow, right? You do this, O Lord, and I will do that. Verse 12. As she continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was speaking in her heart, only her lips moved, and her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli took her to be a drunken woman. So, um, we, we read through Augustine's confessions last year, and Augustine was surprised when he saw Ambrose reading in his study. And Ambrose read the text by looking at the words and just, like, not moving his mouth. And Augustine was struck by this, like, what? Why doesn't he read the words aloud like normal people? It's kind of funny for us because for us it's the opposite. Like no, Almost no one reads aloud except like if they're a child or they're learning to read by reading the words aloud. But for Augustine, this you know, father of the, the Western church, he thought it strange that Ambrose didn't speak the words aloud as he read. He's, he's reading silently. What is this crazy person doing? You know? So um, Hannah's praying. Her lips are moving, but she's not voicing anything. But we're told that she's praying. So... Um, if you, we pray like that sometimes, don't we? You know, uh, you're in the car, you hear an ambulance go by and you pray kind of silently for, you know, all those involved that the Lord protect their life, that sort of thing. Or some, some need comes up and, and you just kind of spontaneously pray and maybe you don't voice it out loud, but you just kind of mouth it with your lips. That's prayer. I mean, the Lord hears that prayer. Um, and Hannah is your, your rock solid proof. I mean, she's, she's, it's said that she is praying. So, may the, the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart, right? But, so, prayer is heard either if it's spoken out loud or if it's thought, you know, just inwardly without, without voicing it. Um, Eli, however, witnesses this. She's weeping. She's sitting presumably alone. She's weeping and she's mouthing words. Eli thinks she's drunk. And Eli, well, let's, let's look at what he says. Verse 14, And Eli said to her, How long will you go on being drunk? Put your wine away from you. But Hannah answered, No, my lord, I am a woman troubled in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for all along I have been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation. So, Eli, his, his response to her is, it's completely misunderstanding, but it's at least good-hearted. He thinks she's a drunk, right? She's, she's weeping, and um, she's, she's mouthing words to herself, and, he, and he's encouraging her, put away the wine. You know, you, you've obviously had too much. You should stop drinking. And Hannah responds, you know, no, my Lord, I'm, I'm a woman troubled in spirit, right? And, and this, is, this is one of those, those lovely turns of phrase that, that shows you the literary quality of this work. 
I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord, right? Pouring out has kind of that, that double entendre thing going on, right? I'm not pouring out wine into my mouth. I'm pouring out my soul to the Lord. She also says, do not regard your servant as a worthless woman. Um, that's a bit of foreshadowing, that worthless woman thing, because we're going to see something similar come up very shortly. But, you know, she, she tells him, look, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm praying out of vexation. My, I'm, I'm, I'm cut to my core, you know. I'm, I'm pouring my soul out to the Lord here. Then Eli answered, uh, verse 17, Then Eli answered, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition that you have made to him. And she said, Let your servant find favor in your eyes. Then the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. Right, so Eli the priest gives her a blessing. You know, the Lord grants your request. Um, she, she goes her way and she eats. Her face is no longer sad. Verse 19. They rose early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord. Then they went back to their house at Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah his wife, and the Lord remembered her. And in due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Samuel, for she said, I have asked for him from the Lord. So a lot going on here. Um, first of all, they, they worship early in the morning, and then they go back to Ramah. <clears throat> if we had had church on December 28th, the reading would have included the city of Ramah, because remember when Herod sends his soldiers to murder the firstborn of Bethlehem, the boys under the age of two. We're told weeping is heard in Ramah. You know, their children are no more. Right, well, Hannah is from Ramah, and she's praying for Samuel. So they go back to Ramah. Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, so she conceives in the natural way. However, at this point, the Lord opens her womb, right? The Lord had closed it up to this point. The Lord remembered her. That, I mean, that's, that's how it's, it's, it's written in Samuel, that the Lord remembered her. Now, again, it's not like the Lord forgets. He's not like us, uh, at least in that way. When the Lord answers prayer, he does so in his good time and according to his will. You know, we, we just got done talking with the catechumens about the nature of prayer, and that's always something to remember, that when we pray to the Lord, he does hear, but his answer is according to his will and in his time. And up to this point, the Lord has seen fit not to answer Hannah's prayer at the time, but now the Lord does remember her. Um, that is, he, he answers her prayer. He, he comes to her aid. In due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son. Now the name here, again, is, is, is wonderful literature because Samuel is just like two words, Shem, uh, U, L, literally, name of him is God, right? El could be the true God. El could be another God. In the case of Samuel, it's pretty safe that the God intended is the true God. But um, so Samuel, however, as a name, makes for some wonderful um, depth of meaning. In the Old Testament, this happens a lot, where someone will be given a name that has a meaning, but it also sounds like another word. The name for Samuel sounds a lot like uh, the name for um, asked. And of course, Hannah calls him Samuel because she asked for him from the Lord. It also sounds a lot like the word for heard. That's going to be important when the boy Samuel is sleeping in the temple. Right? We'll get there later. But a, a, a wonderfully apropos name. So the Lord answers Hannah's prayer, and now she has a son, Samuel. Verse 21, The man Elkanah and all his house went up to offer to the Lord the yearly sacrifice and to pay his vow. 
But Hannah did not go up, for she said to her husband, As soon as the child is weaned, I will bring him, so that he may appear in the presence of the Lord and dwell there forever. Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Do what seems best to you. Wait until you have weaned him. Only may the Lord establish his word. So the woman remained and nursed her son until she weaned him. Oh. So all of Elkanah and all of the families going up to Shiloh. This time, Penina can't mock Hannah because she has, well, one, she's not with them. And two, she has Samuel. Hannah's back in Ramah nursing Samuel. Um, when he's weaned, then she's going to bring him up to Shiloh. Right? Because remember, her vow is that he'll be dedicated to the Lord all the days of his life. So when, when Hannah's ready to hand Samuel over to the Lord, it's going to be permanent. Verse 30, or 24. And when she had weaned him, she took him up with her, along with a three-year-old bull, an ephah of flour, and a skin of wine, and she brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. And the child was young. Then they slaughtered the bull, and they brought the child to Eli. And she said, O my Lord, as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who was standing here in your presence praying to the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me my petition that I made to him. Therefore I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he is lent to the Lord, and he worshiped the Lord there. So, when the time comes when, when the boy is weaned, Hannah brings him up to Shiloh, along with animals for the sacrifice, an ephah of flour, that's like 22 liters, whatever a liter is. I don't speak Canadian. Um, Three-fifths of a bushel, it says. that um, Skin of wine. So she brings him to the house of the Lord. So they slaughter the bull. They bring the child to Eli. Remember, Eli is the, the priest. And Hannah says, remember me? Remember how I sat out here last year and wept? And now, look. The Lord has answered my prayer. I was the one praying for this child I prayed. And she can point to him. You know, I prayed for Samuel. Here he is. And so as long as he lives, he is lent to the Lord. And so he, that he is going to be almost certainly Eli, worshiped the Lord there at Shiloh. I mean, when, when you know, Eli is praying for for Hannah, he, he gives the benediction over her. You know, the Lord grant your request. Uh, he, he speaks a blessing over her. It's a joyous thing to see that a prayer that you prayed for came true, both for Hannah and for Eli. So, what's going to happen in chapter 2 is very familiar to you if you've read the book of Luke. Because after the Lord grants some great thing, they break out in song. Hannah's prayer is, is literarily beautiful. It's very well written. Um, it's also kind of interesting to think of someone in her position saying these words, and, and we'll look at that in a second. Her, her song is going to come in the context of a prayer. That's what we're told at the beginning of verse 1. Hannah prayed and said. So let's look at Hannah's prayer. And Hannah prayed and said, My heart exalts in the Lord. My strength is exalted in the Lord. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. There is none holy like the Lord. There is none besides you. There is no rock like our God. Talk no more so very proudly. Let not arrogance come from your mouth. For the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty are broken, but the feeble bind on strength. Those who were full have hired themselves out for bread, but those who were hungry have ceased to hunger. The barren has borne seven, but she who has many children is forlorn. The Lord kills and brings to life. He brings down to Sheol and raises up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and he exalts. He raises up the poor from the dust. 
He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and, and inherit a seat of honor. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and on them he has set the world. He will guard the feet of the faithful ones, but the wicked shall be cut off in darkness. For not by might shall a man prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Against them he will thunder in heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the power of his anointed. What does that remind you of? Sounds just like the Magnificat, doesn't it? A little like the Beatitudes. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, a thousand years before there is a Mary, here's Hannah praying this, this lovely prayer. Um, and it's, it's one of contrast, right? In, in each of these couplets, you have something that's great, exalted, strong, uh, looked upon, highly regarded, and someone that is low or weak, feeble, impoverished, barren, um, and there, there's going to be an exchange, right? That the rich is going to be brought low, the poor is going to be exalted, the strong is going to be made weak, the weak is going to be lifted up, right? They're, they're trading places, right? Um, so, who's she speaking these words against? It's got to be Penina, right? Like, well, and she's not petty because she's exalting in the Lord, but she's also praising the Lord for what he's done to her. So first of all, look at this confession in verse 2. There is none holy like the Lord. There is none beside you. There is no rock like our God. What does she mean by calling God a rock? Rocks are stable, right? They're reliable. And by rock, I don't think we mean like pebbles or like the kind that you would huck at your brother, like by the crick. I mean like bedrock, like something you would build on. The Lord is stable. He's strong. He's a foundation to be built upon. He's not going anywhere. He, he remains, he doesn't change, right? You can, you can plant your, you, you, can, you can take hold of his promises and know that they're true. And then look at verse three. Talk no more so very proudly. Let not arrogance come from your mouth. For the Lord is a God of knowledge and by him actions are weighed, right? It's a warning to the arrogant. Now, This prayer functions in a very nice way as a prologue to the lives of Saul and David. If only both these men had heeded the words of Hannah's prayer, right? Don't become arrogant. Don't become conceited. Don't become puffed up. Actions are weighed by, by the Lord. And, and on the one hand, she praises the Lord for very specific things. I mean, look at the end of verse 5. The barren has borne seven, but she who has many children is forlorn. Who's the barren? She was, but at this point she only has one son. And Penina, it's not like Penina has lost her children. She still has them. But the Lord has done this great thing for Hannah. And that's what she's praising the Lord for. So what, what meaning would seven have? It, yeah, it can often mean divinity. Yeah, I'm not I'm not sure I'm not sure of an all of a of a significance of seven beyond that here. Um, ride completion. Um, I mean, spoilers, but she's going to have more kids than just 
Samuel. But look at look at verses 9 and 10. This is what we call foreshadowing. He will guard the feet of his faithful ones, but the wicked shall be cut off in darkness, for not by might shall a man prevail. I mean, if, if only they had remembered that in the rest of the time of the judges. Because we, we looked at all of these battles during the time of the judges, the earlier time of the judges, and what was always the determinative factor in any battle that Israel engaged in, it's simply, do you have the Lord's favor or not? It Ultimately, the, the, the tactics, the strategy, the armor, the weaponry, the high ground, the strength of the walls, the superior or inferior numbers, they didn't determine the outcome of the battle. Because there were times when Israel had inferior numbers and a worse tactical position, but the Lord was with them, and so their victory was utter. On the other hand, there were times when Israel had vastly superior numbers, vastly superior position. They had, um, you know, they, they had momentum on their side, but they were apart from the Lord's command, and so they lost badly. Right? So that whole not by might shall a man prevail, always a good lesson for, for Israel. But of course, foreshadowing, especially with this character, because he's going to sometimes remember this and sometimes not. Right? Also, it's important to know that during this time, these guys are in ascent, right? They're ascending in number, they're ascending in strength. And the Canaanites are in general wicked people, but the Philistines are kind of like the, the most Canaanite of the Canaanites, right? All of the worst of the Canaanites is going to be concentrated in the Philistines. And so, I mean, the, mo the most notorious Philistine is, of course, going to be whom? Goliath, right? Um, you know, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? And of course, he's, he's mocking Israel and Israel's God. Um, you know, he, he totally has it coming. We, every time we learn that in Sunday school, you know, you, you cheer when the rock sinks into his forehead because, man, if, if there was anyone that had it coming, it's Goliath, right? Uh, Philistine. He's a Philistine's Philistine. So, um, but they're on the ascent. So the Lord's people are going to have enemies. And those enemies are going to rise up and remain thorns in the flesh, exactly as the Lord promised is going to happen. And so this is, this is not only Hannah's praise over the birth of Samuel. It's also a bit of, of foreshadowing of what's going to come in the rest of the book. That the Philistines are going to be strong. Um, they're going to be wicked. They're going to seem powerful. They're going to be powerful. And they're going to be brought low. Look at the end of verse 10, though. You do not have to be as accomplished as I am and have a B- minus in Hebrew 2. I was never as happy to get a B- minus in my whole life as Hebrew 2. Um, but that last word in verse 10, exalt the power of his anointed, the Hebrew word there is going to be what? Messiah. Or the Greek word there is going to be Christ, right? Right? So, the Lord is going to give strength to his king. Wait a minute. Israel doesn't have kings, right? They have judges. A couple things going on. First of all, they're getting ready to have some kings again. One of the major events in 1 Samuel is when Israel asks for a king. We'll talk about this more when we get to it, but um, that Israel would have a king is already foreshadowed in Deuteronomy when there are rules set up for how Israel's king is to rule. Um, now, the circumstances by which Israel asks for a king are wicked. We're told that. But um, the Lord is already setting up, okay, how should a king of Israel rule? How should he lead? 
So it's not, it's not unknown to Israel that they're going to have a king. That's already set up in the days of Moses. But there's going to be this messianic figure that's kind of lingering all throughout the book. The continuation of this promise that's get, that gets made to, you know, to Noah, to Abraham, right? That's going to continue especially. And of course, all of these promises are, are going to find their fulfillment in one man whose name is David, right? All these promises of Messiah are going to come true in David right up until the moment that they don't. It's so obvious that David is the one. He's born in Bethlehem. He's a king. He rules over all of Israel. He has great success. And then it becomes obvious that he's not the Messiah. Um, so the Lord's going to continue that promise through David's house. He's going to establish a king that comes from David. Spoilers, it's not Solomon either. <laughs> um, so this, this Messiah, this Christ, this figure that's going to be sent, um, this, this promise is going to be held and repeated throughout the book. Um, and this is, this is also a, a foreshadowing of that as well. right? He'll give strength to his king and exalt the power of, really, of his Christ. So a lot going on there in Hannah's prayer, aside from being so beautiful. Then Elkanah went home to Ramah, and the boy ministered to the Lord in the presence of Eli the priest. So at this point, Samuel's been given over to uh, serve the Lord in the temple. He's there. He's ministering to the Lord. He's, he's there with Eli the priest, so he's kind of like doing a shadowing sort of thing. You know, he's, It's not really normal for there to be young boys as priests in the temple, but here he is. Now we're going to get to the sons of Eli. Now on the one hand, Eli seems like a fairly righteous man. Um, but as we know, even good men can be just okay fathers and not really raise good children. And that, that's the case with Eli, right? Verse 12. Now the sons of Eli were worthless men. I mean, talk about cutting to the chase, right? You don't have to discover that inductively through the narrative. You're just told. Yeah, the sons of Eli are worthless men. Um, that, that phrase shows up quite a bit in the Old Testament for, for men who's just, their, their whole being is just opposed to the Lord, right? Uh, when, when Jezebel in, in 1 Kings chapter 17 sends, um, sends men to testify against um, Naboth, who was an innocent Israelite, we're told they were worthless men. You know, Send those worthless men to testify that that he, he blasphemed the Lord and the king, right? And, and of course, they were lying about him. They were worthless men. So the sons of Eli, likewise, worthless men. They did not know the Lord. And so if you want a good working definition of worthless men, there you go, right? Um, that's, that's called epexegetical exposition, right? Where you say the same thing twice so that you can define the first instance by the second. So what does it mean to be a worthless man not knowing the Lord? Uh-huh. Oh yeah, they're priests. They're priests and they're worthless men. So holding office doesn't guarantee good character. Like, as much as I would love that to just be the case, yeah, I'm awesome because I'm the pastor. Like, of course. Um, does not work that way. As a matter of fact, often the people that hold the highest office are the most corrupt. Um, yeah, I mean, we're literally Lutherans, right? I mean, yeah. The guy's the, the head of a whole church and a whole nation, you know. Um, oh, yeah, absolutely. There is no... That's good. There is no rock like our God. Yeah, so obviously the rock isn't Peter. That's, I'll remember that. That's good. <laughs> That's right. I shot a coyote once at 440 yards, and I said, I'm never going to do it again because I'd miss the second time. Now I have an unbroken record. <laughs> right, exactly. Now the sons of Eli were worthless men. They did not know the Lord. The custom of the priests with the people was that when any man offered sacrifice, the priest's servant would come while the meat was boiling with a three-pronged fork in his hand 
and he would thrust it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot, all that the fork brought up the priest would take for himself. This is what they did at Shiloh to all the Israelites who came there. Moreover, before the fat was burned, the priest's servant would come and say to the man who was sacrificing, Give meat for the priest to roast, for he will not accept boiled meat from you, but only raw. And if the man said to him, Let them burn the fat first and then take as much as you wish, he would say, No, you must give it now, and if not, I will take it by force. Thus the sin of the young men was very great in the sight of the Lord, for the men treated the offering of the Lord with contempt. Right? So it's not just, you know, some, some inner hidden sort of thing that makes them worthless men. I mean, that would certainly be sufficient. But they're also outwardly wicked in treating the sacrifice. Now, in the, in the time of Moses, the sacrifices were instituted, and there was always going to be a portion that goes to the priests, right? That's part of how the priests were paid. As they serve in the temple, they take a portion of the meat, and that's what they eat from, and that feeds them. But the first portion was to go to the Lord, right? The fat portion. And if you've ever had a steak, you understand why that is. That's where all the flavor is. That's, where it's, it, that's the best part, right? And that's the part that goes to the Lord. You're literally giving the best part of the animal, the fat portions, to the Lord. Right? It's a way of, of you're, you're giving the first fruits to the Lord and you're learning to give the first fruits to the Lord. Right? So the priests were not to eat before that point. The priests were to eat after those first portions had been sacrificed to the Lord. However, Hophni and Phinehas would send out their servants with a fork and just take it right out of the pot and say, uh, this is for the priests. And if anyone objected, they'd say, uh, we're going to take it by force. So it's, it's, I mean, yeah, they're stealing because it's not given to them. It's not theirs to take. Um, and yeah, they're being, you know, brutish about it. But all this is in the name of the Lord. That kind of arrogance doesn't stand, right? And remember the warning that, that Hannah spoke in her prayer, in her song, about arrogance. Verse 17, Thus the sin of the young men was very great in the sight of the Lord, for the men treated the offering of the Lord with contempt. Samuel was ministering before the Lord, a boy clothed with a linen ephod. And his mother used to make for him a little robe, and take it to him each year when she went up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. That's a cool image, though, right? He's, got, he's, he's a boy. He's got the little linen ephod because he's a priest. I mean, the priest has the ephod. That's part of his garments. And Hannah makes him a little robe for every year that he grows and takes it up with him every time she goes to Shiloh to sacrifice. It's sweet. It's very sweet. Then Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife and say, May the Lord give you children by this woman for the petition she asked of the Lord. So then they would return to their home. Indeed, the Lord visited Hannah, and she conceived and bore three sons and two daughters. And the young man Samuel grew in the presence of the Lord. Right, so five more children for Hannah. They come up every year. She brings the robe that's a little bit bigger for the boy Samuel in the, in the temple. And Eli speaks a blessing over Elkanah and his wife, and then she conceives and they have a child. So uh, not only did the Lord answer the, the, the prayer of Hannah with Samuel, he answers this prayer in, in, you know, in a continuing fashion. Questions so far? All right, well, that's where we made it this morning, so that's pretty good. Um, then let's close with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. All right, thank you.